the recording has now started. Right, sorry about that. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I don't know if we'll get any more people joining, but I thought I would get this session off to a start because I know John has got quite a few slides to talk about. So, um, so welcome to our April 23, uh, April 2023 meetup. So the Open Source Satellite Programme holds regular meetup meetings on a wide range of topics uh, related to the space industry, from applications through modelling, technical topics, hardware related and the wider space ecosystem. We have established the Open Source Satellite Programme with the vision of making space more accessible and to promote the responsible and sustainable utilisation of space. Through the team's own ex personal experiences within the industry, designing, building, operating spacecraft, we have seen at first hand the utility of small satellites and the subsequent growth in that market. And we can see this trend continuing into the future, where the potential for small satellites to influence and make a positive impact in everybody's lives. The Open Source Satellite Programme is being developed for the open source community by the open source community, and you can get involved and I'll have more on that at the end if you are interested. But today I'm really excited to introduce John Paffett, our MD, who will be talking today about the Open Source Boys, which for use with our Kerno Sat1 mission. So I'm going to hand over to John and uh, get this session started. Thanks, Catherine, and morning everybody. So I'm just about to have a little bit of an IT glitch. So just bear with me one moment. Uh, Catherine, can you still see my screen? Yes. Uh, oh, yes, yes, got it. Yep, Perfect. it's all good. All right. So morning or afternoon or wherever you are. Uh, and apologies about my location. Just squealed away in a hotel room at the moment. Um, so I wanted to take the opportunity today um, to talk about a something a little bit different, actually. Um, and it's a program that we've been doing with Spaceport Cornwall um, and uh, some other colleagues in the region, um, which is around Kerno Sat One, and how open source is feeding into that program, um, and in particular, or in particular, the the open source boys. Um, so what I'm going to do then is is give a bit of an overview then of the Kerno Sat One program. Um, I'm going to talk through. Um, um, how that came around and the, the whole rationale for, for ex its existence and, and the overall Kerno SAP program. And then I'll touch a little bit upon the, the open source boy design. So before I do that, it's worth just giving um, you a bit of an up or a bit of an overview of Spaceport Cornwall. Um, because uh, I appreciate that quite a lot of the people on on this call may not even be aware of, of, of the activities. Um, so let me just get rid of that. So Spaceport Cornwall um, is basically the UK's um, first horizontal launch site. Um, so back in 2014, the UK government um, did an assessment. So the, so the UK, interesting enough, is the only country in the world to ever develop, develop a launch vehicle, um, build a satellite, launch it, uh, and then abandon the program. So 50 years later, um, we're now in the process of, of re-establishing launch from the UK. So in 2014, the UK government did a, a review to look for suitable locations in the UK for both horizontal and vertical launch sites um, and identified a number of locations around the country where it felt um, that it would be suitable or possible to establish a, a launch site for deployment of small spacecraft into low Earth orbit. And one of those locations was um, uh, Cornwall Airport, Newquay, um, so just down on the southwest um, of, of the UK. And, and why had they identified um, um, Newquay Airport? Um, basically because of the long runway, um, its proximity to the ocean, and a relatively unpopulated area. So 
In 2014, Cornwall Council received a letter from the Space Agency saying, congratulations, you've been down selected uh, as a possible location for a spaceport. And then the, the council and um, um, a team of people then set about trying to bring that program into, into uh, uh, to fruition, into reality. So that actually culminated um, in us being what I'd describe as, as, as launch ready in 2022. Um, so that involved a, a lot of work in, in um, uh, developing the spaceport facilities, the infrastructure, um, upgrading of the airport, building of buildings, and really just getting ready to, to be able to host the horizontal launch system, which in this case was Virgin Orbit's Launcher 1, uh, to, to be able to, to launch small spacecraft into, into low Earth orbit. Now on the 9th of January, uh, so earlier this year, we did see the historic first launch from the UK, which was amazing. Um, unfortunately, it wasn't a complete mission success, so uh, it did result in a failure of the second stage um, and the loss of the spacecraft. But it did establish the UK spaceport uh, and give us a grounds for um, uh, supporting future launches. So the way I describe it, it was, it was very much a damp ending to what was otherwise an amazing achievement. Um, why am I giving you a bit of a background on Spaceport Cornwall? Um, so as we were going through the process um, of, of raising the funding for the spaceport um, and developing the spaceport, it actually highlighted a number of challenges that we had in the area. So in 2019, we were in the process of securing the money for developing the spaceport. And that was at a time when Cornwall had declared a climate emergency. Um, and so we were the first program through the council um, uh, processes um, to secure the funding that would then enable us to go on and develop the spaceport. And that retreat that um, uh, attracted a lot of attention for the likes of, of Extinction Rebellion and, and other protesters. Uh, one of the things that became really apparent at that point was a complete lack of understanding of the uses of space and the importance of space. Um, in fact, you see a number of the comments that were made. You know, we had people in the auditorium of the council chambers um, busy texting on their mobile phones. Why were we bothering with space based programs? Uh, probably having driven down from London using their satellite navigation systems and then probably going back to their hotels to watch satellite TV. So it's quite clear. Um, from that early engagement that there was a real lack of awareness of the uses and importance of space. One of the other challenges in um, uh, the region is how to inspire and so the sort of inspiration and aspiration of the future generation of engineers and scientists. So there's a bit of a misconception in the region that if you want to get involved in engineering or technology or space related fields, you would have to leave the region, you'd have to go elsewhere. Um, whether it's elsewhere in the UK or overseas or abroad. So real lack of understanding of the opportunities uh, for people to get involved and engaged in science and, and, and engineering type topics. And so it was quite clear that whilst we were busy building this spaceport, there were also some more underlying um, challenges that we were facing. And so we set about and sort of had a, a, a view of or thought about how could we do something about that? And so after what I can only describe as a couple of beers, um, um, we thought about actually devising a program um, of space related programs, um, really to, to, to provide a, a vehicle, a framework for engaging with the community and to really promote the uses and applications of space. And so we devised the, the Kerno SAP program. Kerno is, is um, um, Cornish for, for Cornwall, so Cornwall Satellite Programme. Um, and the real vision there basically was to engage with the community in the development and implement, implementation of satellite programmes to address local challenges, issues and needs. So really sort of bringing space down to earth and down to Cornwall. But a lot of what I'm going to talk about is, is equally applicable to other parts of the UK and other parts of the world. Um, but really try to find a way of making space more relatable. Um, and so the idea was, could we start to get a number of programs moving forwards that would make space more relevant to people? Um, and so 
we sort of set about to set out the objectives to say, okay, we want to increase people's awareness of the use and the values, the importance and reliance of space-based systems, um, really to encourage and promote and stimulate the activities in education and employment, and, and actually to sort of really encourage people to look to design and build and operate space-based systems locally um, and, and systems that address local needs. Um, I did a piece of work with the council a number of years ago um, where we were talking about the, the the space strategy and actually space cuts across everything that's or, or a lot of the the, the 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 topics of interest within the region things like agriculture and offshore energy and marine environmental monitoring uh, and even mining so so we said okay can we develop a program uh, or a framework that enables us to do some of those activities so that would then give us a foundation that we could build upon and really that goal was to stimulate groups within Cornwall and across the country into developing and launching and operating satellite missions so we had this dream we had this vision of, of how we might go about doing that um, and then basically we step set about deciding how to sort of move that idea and turn that idea from an idea into reality and our first step was 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 Kernosat one. So this was to basically attract a small amount of money to enable us to do a, a, a first satellite. Um, so it's a Cornwall's community satellite program focused around and, and you'll see in a minute we've focused it very much around marine environmental monitoring. But the aim really was to design and build and launch and operate a small satellite um, and, and have a framework for participation within the community uh, and, and for outreach. Um, and then looking at how you know that program could unlock other opportunities in the future. So, so whilst the first mission is 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 targeted on one particular application, you can actually see a number of programs in the future that could be used for things like climate and environmental monitoring, harsh environmental research, geospatial intelligence, agriculture, um, etc. So what we did was sort of set out a roadmap, as it were, with with Kernosat one being the very first spacecraft, but conceiving or, or, or imagining that there could be a number of satellite related programs in the future. Um, so so that was sort of the program that we put in place. And, and now I'm going to tell you a little bit about Kernosat one. But what I really want to pull upon is, is how we've been looking as we've been moving forwards about how we could utilize and embrace open source um, uh, existing open source hardware or software or other approaches. Uh, and then we'll say come back to the boys in a moment. So Kernosat one was was very much the first step. Um, we were fortunate to have the G7 summit in, in Cornwall uh, in 2021. Uh, and off the back of that, we were able to put forward a proposal for small amounts of funding to help us with the design and the build of that first spacecraft. What we wanted to do, again, going back to the overall um, objectives of the Kernosat program, was to have a, an activity that enabled us to increase people's awareness, to promote and stimulate space and engineering related education employment, to, to look at the design and the build and the operation of a, of a space based system to address local needs. Now, there's a lot of different things that we could have focused on. As I said, space does cut across many, many of, 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 of the activities across the region. Um, but for those that aren't aware, you know, Cornwall is on the southwest of the UK. There's a lot of coast. So the one thing that the majority of people can relate to um, within the region is the oceans. Um, and so we thought, well, actually, what would be a very good um, um, first mission would be to do something around mar marine environmental monitoring. Um, so, you know, lots of challenges with things like coastal pollution, um, with sewage, um, but also a number of other applications. So looking at things like um, uh, the growth of seagrass, um, kelp forests, um, seaweed, for example. So there's a number of marine environmental related topics that are of interest to a large number of people within Cornwall. And, and with the ocean being so close to the majority of people, you know, it's something that everybody can relate with. So we said, OK, as this is the first mission and the whole goal of that mission is to 
was to engage with the wider community, doing something around the ocean would be a great idea. Now, just to sort of set some context though, we're not talking about a big satellite program. So this is not a huge satellite that costs 10 or 100 million. What you're talking about here is a small shoebox size spacecraft. You know, we were fortunate enough to secure a small grant of about 150,000 um, pounds. And, and unfortunately in space that doesn't go very far. Um, but so really we wanted something that we could do in a, in a very small spacecraft. Um, our first idea was was actually to put up a small spacecraft with what we call an, an, an ocean color monitoring payload. So basically a camera that is tuned to um, uh, color bands that are of interest for monitoring of the oceans. Um, and so we were looking at a, a CubeSat based solution with a simple ocean monitoring payload. Um, and in fact, because we were keen to have this community engagement part, we were actually looking to build that solution around the Portland State University's ORSAT design. So this is an open source um, satellite platform design that was, was developed by Portland State University. In fact, we should actually get them to do a talk at some point because the stuff the team there is doing is absolutely amazing. Um, and so we thought, OK, we can we can use an open source spacecraft. We can get a couple of groups within Cornwall to help design and build um, a satellite solution based upon that that platform design. Of course, one of the challenges, as I say, is we're talking about a satellite platform that is really sort of shoebox size. So it weighs a couple of kilos. It's about 10 centimetres by 10 centimetres by about 30 centimetres was that original design. Um, what we found is as we started to engage with the community, though, we were getting a lot of feedback back from the stakeholders that were identified quite a number of weaknesses in that proposed initial and initial sort of uh, concept and a number of potential refinements or enhancements. So one of the challenges with with the CubeSat with the ocean kind of um, payload on board was very limited coverage. So impacted by cloud cover. A very small satellite, you know, fortunately you can't break the laws of physics. So the very small satellite is going to be limited in the size of the aperture, the size of the camera that it can carry. So the 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 image quality is 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 is, is not necessarily very good. Um, and so we thought, well, OK, maybe flying the ocean color payload is is not the most appropriate solution. So we thought about could we do something different? Um, and in fact, that led to an evolution from flying a camera to flying a small communications payload. And I'll come back to that in a moment because that's enabled us to push the instrumentation out into the ocean. The other thing is we were quite conscious that one of the things that we wanted to do was have a, um, um, a program that allowed community involvement and in particular in, in build activities. Now, it's very difficult to have a lot of people involved in the build of a very small spacecraft. Uh, if you think about it, that spacecraft's made up of, of a small number of subsystems, so four or five subsystems. Um, it doesn't really involve, you know, give much opportunity for having too many people to have hands-on uh, engagement with hardware and, 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 and a really sort of hands-on building. And so we thought, well, actually, could we could we expand that capability opportunity? And by going to the small communications payload and by incorporate and by modifying our approach, um, uh, that's led us to a solution that has a number of what I'd call ground based terminals or in this instance, the boys or the instrumentation packages. So individual people and groups could be building these. Um, massively opens up the opportunity for people to be involved and engaged in the build of elements of this system, which is which is brilliant. So so we evolved the design. We changed from a camera based payload to a low rate data packet communications payload. So what you're talking about is a small radio that is transmitting small bursts of data that might be a measurement of temperature or ocean clarity um, or wave height, for example. And so then the satellite collects this data and relays it back down to the users. Um, this is not a new concept. Uh, this is used for things that they call such as machine to machine or Internet of Things or telemonitoring. So used quite extensively on uh, terrestrial based activities. And I think 
Rob Cartwright from Verfa Seals on, on, on this call as well. He's, I, I call him uh, the king of Laura Wan in, in the region. So they do a lot of really interesting work on um, the use of those types of systems for things like building building uh, management systems and uh, environmental monitoring, a whole range of applications. So, so what we've done with that design iteration then is basically push the measurements of the marine environment from the spacecraft down into the ocean. So now we're able to do in situ measurements of the marine environment by putting instruments on either buoys or boats or even on the pontoons. And so that gives us a, 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 a much more uh, freedom in the design of those bits of equipment, but also in the things that we're measuring and how we're going about measuring them. So that really opens up the potential for much, much more engagement in the program. Um, and so what we're now talking about then for Kernosat one is buoy and boat based sensors. So it really does open up that 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 that, that opportunity. And, and here's a, a couple of pictures of an of an example buoy um, um, solution that was developed a number of years ago. And I'll come back to this in a little bit as well. And so once we once we sort of move away from a space based collection system to to a, a in situ measurement based system, that opens up the ability to do a whole range of different measurements. So, so, and and to 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 um, uh, for different users to be selecting different things to measure. So we may have one group that's interested in measuring wave height, for example. We may have another group that's interested in measuring ocean clarity and temperature, uh, or somebody else trying to find a way of measuring calcium content, for example, or, or oxygen saturation or salinity. Um, so we're able to, by changing the sensors on some of these uh, buoys to be able to measure different things. And so the way this system basically works is we have a satellite in orbit and that satellite is in what's called a low Earth orbit. So it's whizzing around the Earth at about 500 kilometres. It orbits the Earth about in, in about 90 minutes. Um, so as it passes over the area where the buoys are, it will collect the data. And then as it passes over a ground station, it will download that data to the ground station that is in process and then it's fed back to the user community. So it's what we call a store and forward system. So we we recover the data, we then download it and forward it on to the um, um, to the end users. And the sort of technology that we're looking at using um, and and uh, this is this is one of the examples is a group called Lacuna. Um, who have themselves developed a satellite based system. And so this is a small um, radio transmitter that transmits these small data packages um, which contain the measurements that were made up into the spacecraft. And so I say it's low Earth orbit, so satellites whizzing around at about 500 kilometres or will be when, once it's launched at about 500 kilometres collecting that data. The other design iteration that we had to have was unfortunately at the time at which the program was awarded um, was um, also coincided with COVID and the world chip shortage. So for those that aren't aware, a lot of the semiconductors, microcontrollers and memories that you find in things like your mobile phone um, and in cars and in, in, in your consumer electronics and your game consoles, um, they're in very short supply at the moment. Um, parts that would often um, uh, be available in a matter of days are now not available for 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 months and years. In fact, one of the the parts that um, or a number of the parts in the Orsat spacecraft design that we're looking to use were on over over a year lead time. So that's just not compatible with the program that we we were looking to put in place. Um, and then the other issue that we had was by going to this communications payload and by wanting to have the communications payload on all the time that we we're orbiting the Earth, that's driven the power ups. So we actually need a slightly larger platform. So that meant that unfortunately we had to move away from the ORSAT open source platform design um, and towards a, a slightly different solution. So a sort of six U satellite platform. Um, I'm not going to go into to a huge amount of detail about the actual all sat satellite platform design today, although I think we will come back and do a presentation about it at a later date because um, we're actually using the open source satellite 
um, onboard computer and flight operation or uh, flight software as the core of, of Kerno Sat One. So it's a good discussion to have. And actually, we're also looking to use the YAMS um, uh, ground mission operation software, which again is open source for the control and operations of spacecraft. But so we, we had to have an iteration of the platform design and move away from the OSAT design to a six U satellite platform. But again, we're still embracing the elements of open source with kits on board computer, flight software, YAMS, and, and then the boys. So with the boys then, um, what we wanted to do again is, is find a way of just opening up um, and maximizing the potential for community engagement. And, and what better way of doing that than to sort of embrace open source and to come up with reference designs that people can take and tailor and adapt and modify for their purpose. And here's an example. This is a, 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 a one that was developed and I'll put the link in here. You can go and find the web page and dig around. This was something that was developed back in 2015, um, looking at sort of ocean weather boys, for example. So, so it's one example, um, <coughs> excuse me, bear me a second. This young lady um, also came up with her own design as well. And I think this is brilliant because as we engage with the schools and the colleges, um, things like these blogs with with this young lady on on the instructables and the, the smart boy um, just just shows how accessible the technology is and how easy it is for people to develop and build systems. Um, and it, and it just makes it so much more approachable. So so it's great because it it really encourages that sort of hands on engagement into the design and build of some of these things. And and so we've been using these as a, as a starting point and looking at how to take it forwards. And so if we look at some of these, what you're talking about is is, is small boy designs that are drawing upon readily available um, electronic modules in this instance. So uh, whether they're bought from Adafruit or SparkFun or even off of Amazon, you, know, you can buy many of the many of the parts that we need for the boys, you know, readily available even on Amazon, um, and be able to connect these things together and and put them out in the ocean and be able to make measurements of of, of, of you know the different properties and things. So so it gives good but basis of, of start, and we've been using a lot of this material in things like hackathons and things which I'll come back to in a bit a little bit later as well. So really looking at how to build on on existing designs and then come up with a reference design ourselves. So this is the other this is another example of of a, of a small boy design that somebody's come up with. Um, quite a lot of engineering challenges both on the electronic side but also on the mechanical side. Um, the, the the sea is unfortunately very unforgiving. Um, Anybody that's ever tried to make anything that survives in the ocean for very long will know um, that salt water gets everywhere. Um, and so, you know, materials degrade, salt water gets in, parts stop working. The other challenge, of course, is if you've got your little boy out in the ocean, you know, you've got to be very conscious about power control. So if I just go back up to this design, you know, part of the design of these boys you know, it needs to preserve power. So we've got solar solar cells that are generating, you know, they're taking the the um, illumination from the sun, they're generating power, they're charging up a battery. Um, but we've got you know, microcontrollers and sensors and transmitters, which are all then consuming that power. So what you don't want to do is have to go out into the ocean, bring, this, bring the boy back, charge it up and put it back out there again. So power consumption is quite critical. So in this design, You've got basically a real time clock, which is turning on and off the microcontroller. Um, so basically it, it will come on, it will do its measurements, it will transmit its data up to the spacecraft. And once it's done, it will turn off again and go to sleep for a while, conserve energy and then repeat that activity. So, so these are all the sort of fundamental building blocks that feed into that boy design. The reference designs I showed earlier are not specifically to Kernosat. Um, um, the one that was done for Smart Boy was about communicating to uh, uh, through Wi-Fi to mobile phone, for example. Um, um, there's other ones that are communicating through 3G and 4G. Um, what we want here is something that's going to communicate to the spacecraft through what we call LoRaWAN. So we're in the process at the moment of designing 
that reference kernel set design. So we have that collateral, that material that we can put out into the community so that people can go and build their own. Um, again, that gives us that ability to have very hands on engagement into the into the design and operation of those of of those um, um, boys. And it's great because it's it that all of the um, parts are are accessible and 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 you know, readily available. So that opens up things for like lab and class based activities, and it's good for demonstrating and explaining some of the principles of electronics, not just the the the, the space and the boys and the and the marine environment to monitoring. So so it, it makes it really sort of hands on for people to get involved in. Um, um, and even to the point where we've started running a number of hackathons. Uh, we did one back in 2022. We're looking to do one this year. In fact, we did a couple in 2022. Um, and really throwing open the opportunity for people to sort of do hands on experimentation with some of these bits of equipment so they can make their own measurements. You know, that was part of the goal is is getting to the point where they can make a boy and have it floating out in the pond out in the, the playground, for example. Um, and really get some hands on experience in 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 how to, to to build and program some of these microcontrollers, how to communicate between two radios, how to take that data and observe the data. Um, and even some of the real challenges of how do you take all these measurements and scrunch these measurements up into small data packets to be sent up to the spacecraft, because this is not like a, a, a fiber optic link to your house or broadband link to your house. It's very data constrained. And so, you know, you have to be thinking about how can you be smarter in in taking the measurement data and compressing that down before it's sent on. So that so what we've seen with the hackathons is is really great engagement and 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 I love the the one that we did at Eden was was amazing because we were there talking about the marine environment monitoring. In fact, we had a couple of different groups that came in, um, uh, Falmouth Harbour, um, and, a, and a couple of other groups, all of who uh, have interest in making measurements of the the marine environment looking at things like as i was saying earlier um seagrass and seaweed and kelp um and looking at ocean uh, pollution and other elements like that and that was great because it gave people real context of what they were looking to do but what we found with the students that attended the hackathon is yep they they had a lot of fun building things for marine and environmental monitoring but actually a couple of those groups then went on to um do some of their own activities looking at things like agriculture and in fact one group put a proposal into the uk space agency for doing a small um agriculture related spacecraft so it's great it, it really empowered and in, encouraged um a whole group of people that came into the room not really knowing very much about electronics or software or space to be really fired up by what you could do by spacecraft and so we're, we're, we're continuing to repeat that and, and grow those activities on the lead up to the launch of kernosat which will be um early next year we hope so um, so where are we going with all this then? So we've got a number of ongoing activities. Um, we're developing the open source Kernosat reference boy design. And so I'm hoping that will be finished off and published, published um, later this summer and then actually producing some kits of parts so that people can, you know, rather than having to go buy the parts piecemeal from different locations, they can get them from us uh, or they can still go buy them from elsewhere. Um, we are expanding the community engagement. So um, with both the use of that reference design, but also it's not fixed. You know, it's not a case of here's a design, you have to use that design. So what we're seeing is as people are engaging with what we're putting out into the community, you know, they're taking it and they're further developing the reference design themselves. So what you're seeing is is a real growth of those activities. What we're also looking to do is, is start to um put out some what i'd call design challenges um one of the challenges um that you see from from this image is a lot of these boys are using you know small plastic uh boy designs you know if you're thinking about sustainability and and, and, and marine environmental monitoring you know we don't want to be adding to the ocean microplastics issue so can we come up with boy designs that are using more sustainable um and bio biodegradable materials for example 
balancing that off obviously with with the fact that they need to operate in a marine environment so so it's some interesting challenges there that we're looking at um also the survivability of those boys to say the sea is very unforgiving so how can we how can we have something that on the one hand can be easily produced by somebody but the other hand can operate out in the ocean for a, a large period of time um and so there's some really interesting design challenges that that having this as a, a framework enables us to to get out into the community and really uh, engender that sort of spirit of of of, of, of challenge and, and, and engagement so that's some of the ongoing activities and saying it's really looking about how we can sort of then expand out into that to that micro system uh, ecosystem and, and and really look at how to embrace and take those designs forwards so so that gives you a sort of a bit of an insight and and a lot of this is say only you know, it becomes much more possible because of things like the open source licensing regime, you know, being able to give designs to people that they're able to take and build themselves or take and evolve and, and iterate themselves without having to worry about sort of intellectual property issues and um, and, um, uh, and and the fact that a lot of this stuff is is a lot more open and there's tutorials and other elements out there all enables much much more engagement from the community which is excellent so that's really what i was going to cover today um so really just sort of wrapping up then you know if, if you think about the the kerno sap programs and the objectives of the program um it was there to increase people's awareness um certainly as we've been engaging with the community on this particular activity we're seeing a lot more um awareness of how space fits in and that will continue to grow as we continue to engage with people um the the the, the second objective of, of engaging and promoting and stimulating sort of regional space and engineering related education and employment you know, we've been heavily engaged with exeter university true pyramid college and others in, in 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 fact many of the students from the hackathon were from both of those establishments um, and really getting them involved and, and interested in how space and engineering related activities um, play a role and, and and the opportunities that they 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 represent and then that third one again is is on that design the build and the operation of space-based system and so by having people looking at how they can use and build and utilize um, things like space-based systems you know, helps to sort of proliferate the activities through the region which is which is brilliant and say open source is really enabling that on the Kernosat program so it does provide that opportunity for a much greater community engagement it enables parties to design and build their own boy designs or instrumentation packages and so really does open up that horizon which is which is fabulous um and and really provides a catalyst as well so that's the other element as well you know why are we why are we putting the effort into coming up with the, with the kerno sat reference design is not to say here's the design that has to be used but really to provide that catalyst or that starting point for the community to develop and evolve further and, and coming up with the solutions and, and their own solutions um you know it's uh, what you're trying to do is 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 um um you're trying to to invoke people's imagination and 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 for them to come up their own ideas the own challenges that they can solve with with space-based technology so so you know that's all enabled by the open source reference design where will it go i think we have to wait and see I say we've already even through the early activities that we've done through things like the eden hackathon last year we've already seen you know a a, a real growth with the interest in the area and lots of different ideas and sparking off of that for how space-based systems um, can benefit or the, be used to do different ranges of applications and services. So I was going to leave it there for today. Um, are there any questions from anybody? Is there anything in chat, Catherine? I can't. Uh, I haven't seen anything in the chat. So, uh, one question I've got is: so, if people uh, obviously this is an ongoing program, so how are people going to follow and figure out what we're up to, so they know where to go for their hackathons? <laughs> so. Yeah. So, so we've been discussing that recently with um, 
spaceport team. Obviously, a lot of a lot of the focus at the end of last year and the beginning of this year was on uh, achieving the first launch from the UK. So that's now been achieved. Um, we're now ramping up on the Kernel Sat One and the engagement activities around that. So you'll see us publicise the um, uh, the Kernel Sat reference design. We'll do that through the open source satellite channel as well as through the spaceport channel, um, and just follow both the kiss the open source satellite and the spaceport Cornwall. Um, social media, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, um, sites where you can find more information uh, or inf or email the info um, at Open Source Satellite or info at KISS or info at Spaceport Cornwall for more information. Brilliant. Has anybody else got any questions? All very quiet out there. So really inspirational, particularly on the STEM front, and it's uh, they're inspiring children. And the STEM, it's not just it's it's a fabulous project because it's not just the space side, but it's all space and technology, all technology, and you know the marine environment and learning, and also get kids learning about environmental stuff, biology, and you know plant growth and sea growth, and even ourselves, the team here at KISP, are, are learning lots of things about how seaweed grows and how seagrass grows and how important it is for carbon sequestration, etc. So it's a fantastic project for um, um, promoting lots and lots of different angles of STEM into the community. So, um, so that's a fantastic project. Yeah. Okay. So um, thank you. Uh, unless there are any other questions, thank you, John, for a highly informative talk. Really interesting. Um, if people don't want to speak up on this particular call and want to ask some questions, please feel free to uh, um, message us from um, either through the chat or or through the means that John mentioned through the email system, and we'll be very happy to answer any questions. So, um, so I'll wrap up, I guess. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Um, and if you are interested in the more general open source satellite program, there are a number of ways you can be involved. You can sign up on um, the website or through LinkedIn to keep uh, to get updates on what we're doing. Um, you could contribute to projects in areas such as software or hardware or marketing activities. If you're working on a mission or developing a mission, you could be an early adopter. Um, or you could, um, we have these regular meetups um, every couple of months at the moment. So if you would like uh, to give a presentation um, um, as one of these meetups, that would be absolutely fantastic. We we did have a few months ago, uh, Dawn Aerospace do a talk, which was amazing. So we'd be very happy to host. Or you could sponsor us, which is another route. So, so that's about wraps up our session. Um, our next session will be in June with a topic to be announced. Uh, so that'll be Thursday, the 22nd of June, at uh, about half four British summer time. So um, watch um, the usual LinkedIn and the media for an announcement of what the topic will be and come along in June. OK, so I'd like to thank John again for a really excellent talk and I hope, hope you show appreciation and Thank you very much and good night. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Hey, John. Oh, he's gone. Right. OK. I have to stop the recording. Uh...